so I'll just run through the agenda. Uh, apologies, uh, Paul Frew has recorded his apology for this week. Uh, he recorded his apology for this week during last week's meeting. Uh, there's been an apology has been received from Philip. Uh, so you've got his vote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no further apologies. Uh, Jim Wells has said you said Pat Jim's going to yeah, be he's late. A little late. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, any declarations of interest? Some whistling from somewhere. Uh, if we move on to the draft minutes and proceedings, and four members of the draft minutes of the meeting are the 9th of December 2020 or at page six. Uh, members, are you content with the draft of the minutes? Um, sorry, Chairperson. Jim, I think you might have your microphone on. Do you want to mute? All right, thank you. Sorry, thank you very much indeed. That was an entertaining start to it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody happy with the minutes? I'm not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm doing the chair's spot because actually during yesterday's evenings I read them in great deal of detail. I think on um, page two of the minutes and page six in your table of papers, it refers to uh, Gemma as Dolan MLA. I, I, I don't that. think that is appropriate and I would like that to be amended to read Gemma Dolan MLA. It just goes to show you that even as a chairman, I do occasionally read the minutes. I actually noticed that, but I didn't want to be too pedantic. So <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> so, with the exception of that, are we content to agree the minutes? And we agreed the minutes we published on the website. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to matters arising, uh, last week's meeting, and may I uh, say uh, an apology last, uh, last week? I was pulled away for a series of uh, discussions about Brexit and supposed discussions with the Secretary of State that ran on, but uh, I understand that uh, uh, my deputy ably chaired the meeting and it has been pointed out by um, Mr Catney that it was shorter than our usual sort of meeting, so I don't know whether what, what to take of that, but there we go. Um, remind members of the last week's meeting, members received oral evidence from the Department on the outcomes of its consultation on the proposed amendments to the Building Regulations NI 2012. Members recall that officials referred to the widely held view that materials used on site rarely matched to what was tested under BS 8414. Uh, I just want to read out a note here I have that the BS 8414 test is undertaken by test facilities which have been accredited to UCAS. However, the materials used in a building differ from those tested. It will be a matter for building control to ensure compliance prior to it being given approval for completed works. A move towards standards that are stricter than BS 8414 without improved regulation does not resolve the issue that materials used on site may not match what was tested. It does nothing to improve compliance with whatever standard is ultimately agreed. There seems to be a suggestion in the Department's statement that for whatever reason, building control is not able to check for compliance with specification. In its response to the consultation, Building Control NI raises some issues regarding the lack of guidance in the proposals and the consequential potential for confusion and lack of consistency. Building Control NI also commented that, while the established BS 8414 test and classification methodology provides a mechanism for determining adequacy for tested systems, there is little understanding of what rate of fire spread is achieved with various combinations of materials. The committee is due to receive oral evidence from UCAS on the 13th of January. However, if there is a known weakness in the system, the committee may wish to review the matter to ensure that the materials used on site comply with the specification tested. The committee may also therefore wish to consider scheduling oral evidence from Building Control NI. I'd just like to um, inform the members that Building Control NI is the umbrella group for building control departments in the 11th, on the 11 councils. On its website, it states that Building Control is responsible for ensuring that the building regulations, a set of construction standards led down by Parliament, are enforced by your local council. The standards include requirements on health, structural stability, fire safety, energy conservation and accessibility. Um, I think for anybody who has been following what has been going on in the Grenville inquiry and listening to some of the evidence we have received already, I think it's important that we do get the opportunity to listen to Building Control NI. 
And if you are in agreement with that, I would like to seek your members' views about asking them to come and give us oral evidence, if we are content. I would also like to seek your views to write to the Department to request a response to the following. In noting the Department's assertion that materials tested under BS 8414 test conditions rarely replicates that is tested in the BS 8414 test and proposes to require that non-combustible material be used as a means to improve fire safety. Given that BS 8414 is internationally recognised as a robust test, can the Department explain why a completed building would not comply with the standard? And does this suggest that building control regime has, is, uh, has problems in carrying out its enforcement responsibilities? Are we content for that? Secondly, why is it necessary to legislate for this widely known view rather than by seeking to introduce a more stringent regime in the approval process by building control? How can this approval process be strengthened to ensure that materials used on site are equal to the specification of materials tested under BS 8414 test conditions? I think we would be content for that to write to the Department on those issues. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Move on to item 5 on the agenda, Oral Evidence Department of Finance. Could we invite Stuart and Janice in, please? Hi, Stuart. Hi, Janice. Okay, team, this is uh, the purpose for uh, getting information on the January, January monitoring round. The clerk's briefing paper is at page 14. The departmental brief is on uh, page 17. And, uh, sorry, uh, Stuart, are you going to start off, are you? Yes. Uh, Please. I mean, hopefully you have had time to read it, but I shall not go through it verbatim. But um, certainly, the bottom line is um, that... Uh, at the end of October monitoring, um, we had a 212 budget and far as resources concerned, and that included a, a 35 million allocation for the restrictions uh, support scheme, and our net capital budget was 21. Um, in January monitoring, um, looking at going forward, um, as far as non-ring fence is concerned, we are looking at an easement of around 3.8 million. And uh, that's made up of uh, a variety of things, but mostly maintenance at the moment. A lot of the buildings are closed, so there's not the same level of maintenance, and even with people going in, not the same level of fuel being used, so there's a reduction in their vacancy management. Because of the situation, there hasn't been the opportunity to fill vacancies in the same way, so there'll be uh, a slight easement from there. Contract modification, um, as part that arose from part of um, BT, um, who were unable to get the contract started in time um, due to start in March for the um, public sector network. Mm -hmm. So we had to pay the um, existing contractor to do that, and BT paid us the money for that. Um, 70 grand, 75 grand enough? Uh, no, 800. Oh, was it? Sorry, I must have read the wrong thing. <laughs> 100K. So. Same question. Is 800 grand enough? Uh, we think so. Um, so, um, and then there's some reduction in the level of debt recovery, just because of the current circumstances as well, hasn't been able to work. So, that that makes up the the 3.8 million. Um, at the moment, in capital, um, uh, we're not intending giving anything up. We did give up nearly seven million in October monitoring, um, but at the moment, we'll keep it under review, as we will the resource. Um, but we're not giving up anything in capital at the moment. In addition to that, we're expecting to get a further 55 million to enable the, um, say, the uh, local restrict restrictions support. Uh, further, that will take that up to around 90 million for that particular one. Uh, and uh, just to bring you up to date on that, um, I think there's been 52 million actually spent on that to date. I think we had 52. Yeah, we had 23 in there, but up, up to, as of today, it's 52 that's been spent on that. Uh, so, as I say, of course, we'll, we'll keep these all under review. Uh, we're not expecting major changes, but we'll keep it under review, and uh, we will write to you and give us our final position as requested. Okay. 
sorry, there's another 7.8 million that you probably airports as well. Yep, and that we're will be included we're, in our budget. Yep, and we'll be talking about that later on. We're sort of considering the SL when it comes come, comes in, comes before us. Okay. Right. Going to be kind, is it Christmas? Oh, <laughs> Team, this is the finance committee. Come on, Jim. Sorry. Yeah, um, you said there's 52 million paid out. Sorry, my mic's way back here. You said there's 52 million uh, on the um, COVID support money paid out. How does that sit with the last sentence of the note of a paragraph? Of your briefing note, where it says, as of 2nd of December, 6494 different claimants have been paid out a total of 23.4 million. Yeah, well, sorry, that, that, the, the 52 million is the up to date position? From the 2nd of December? No, as of, as as of today. today. Yes, but yeah. at the 2nd of December it was 23. Yeah. And as of today, 52. Ten days later, it's 52. <coughs> oh, well, where's that? Um, seems I mean, stri a LPS. striking rise in ten days. Uh, well, LPS have obviously been working very hard to get the grant site. And they're at the, yes. There's a lot of applications in. They've been processing to get the grant site. So they've been working weekends and long money out, obviously, to the businesses. So it's a... Uh, reflection good. of the good work that's been done there. Okay. The only other question I had was the eight hundred thousand that came back from BT mm -hmm. was that really a book exercise because that money already had been paid out to the other contractor, yes? Uh, well um, we will actually get the full benefit of the eight hundred K so it's not really a book exercise. It will be taken off um, bills that we're continuing to pay. So will actually realise real benefit of the 800k. But BT weren't able to give you the service, so but you had a previous service provider. Yes, yeah. BT were so taking. Presumably, you're continuing to pay. Uh, well, no, not 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 anymore. This was for a period of, of six months that they just right. delayed for. So yes. that was sort of by way of a compensatory payment for having to extend the the contract of the previous contractor. Mm. Just going back into sort of the BT piece, because obviously, and we're not going to step on the toes of the Public Accounts Committee, they're dealing with the land web at the moment. Mm -hmm. But is this with the same business area of BT? Uh, no, as land web, no. It's, um, it's, it's on the IT side, if you like, public shared service network. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Jim? Any more? No, thanks. Jim? Can I just ask, and you might not actually know the answer to this, um, you know the delay in recruiting staff for NISRA, will that have an impact on the census? Um, it, sh it shouldn't have. I mean, we're the, um, NISRA are keeping a very close eye on what's happening, um, not only with recruitment, but if, if there are any sort of restrictions in place when it comes to actually doing the census, so they'll be keeping that under review and, and they have contingencies to whether it has to be postal, whether it has to be use of IT, you know, to, to compensate at the time. So hopefully it shouldn't have an impact. They're still planning to go ahead as, as planned. Okay, thank you. That's me. Good job. Matthew? Thank you. Um, that's sorry we're not completely letting you off of the festive season, <laughs> but you'll appreciate your... Yeah, it was your, too good to be true. You know, you'll appreciate your, um, appreciate your, your turkey whenever, um, because, uh, given the wheel, if you greet you the ringer a bit. Um, not really. Is there a... Oh, so on the easement of 3.8 million, that's is that all in capital because it's all no the 3.8 million sorry mm -hmm. is all resource it's all resource non ring right. fence resource right okay. I know it sort of seems a bit strange that we're getting an extra 55 million resource but that will be ring fenced for the local restrictions this yeah. is for normal um, day to day stuff we're giving up the 3.8 that's dead okay the the 52 million so you have at the minute the alloc the, the total allocation for Localised restrictions grants is 55? Uh, no. no, it will be 90 now because 90. we had 35 in the last monitoring round yeah. plus 55, so it will be a total of 90 now. So a total of 90 with 52 spent at the minute as of today. And so that's, um, the, 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 say you've had a sharp, got a lot out the door in the last fortnight. Basically, do, is there any sense of 
that that kind of profile of rise is going to continue. Obviously, the um, the scheme closes for applications. I think fairly soon. Um, or yeah, I I don't know. I think they are profiling to. I mean, and, and the fifty five was probably based on on getting that profile up to the ninety ninety million. Um, I don't know exactly what the profile is going forward. I'm sure we can find that out for you. Right. Yeah, but you, that will obviously be. Um, Interesting to find out exactly because it's quite, it's quite a sharp increase recently. Not that that's that's obviously welcome. On capital, um, what are your main? What are the issues around capital? Obviously, there have been some concern about capital spending in departments generally getting out the yeah. door. Obviously, finance does not have it. It's not like infrastructure it doesn't have a huge. Yeah, no, ours is a relatively small um, capital budget, um, and. There has been a few slippage in some projects, but not not a not a huge amount. So we've given up seven million. Some of that um, is in around, um, you know, just not being able to get contractors in to do work and things. So, um, given up seven million to the centre to be reallocated. Yes, that'll be reallocated. Yes. As ca- that'll be reallocated as capital yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, or we hope it'll be reallocated in this uh, before the end of. Uh, financial year yes, well, the hope is it, w- it would be allocated to other departments if they can spend it this this financial year. Yes, I mean there is a f- obviously an agreement um, between at the centre as to how much can be carried over each year. Uh, I don't know what that is at the moment for the two, all departments, but um, it should be spent this year if we give it back. But in broad terms, um, sorry, the six point nine was that was given up. Set that's the same as the seven you just mentioned that was given up in October on um, yeah, capital. The, yeah, yeah. Well, the six point nine. I was writing it up to seven. The six point nine. It was given up in October monitoring. Yeah. So that may well have already been reallocated. I'm not sure. Right. It could be reallocated in this monitoring round. And in terms of headline potential headline underspend from the department, you're relatively confident that, on the basis that you're big, you know, getting the 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 ninety out the door, that there's not there aren't going to be any significant underspend issues for the department come year end. Uh, I. I, I think, unfortunately, particularly on the 90 million, which is demand-led, mm-hmm. it, it would be very difficult for me to stand here and put my hand in my heart and say yeah. we won't have an underspend on that, or an, indeed a pressure on that. Um, it obviously depends on on the applications coming through on that. That's it is something that is outside our control. Mm. I know slightly straying into broader departmental territory, but that. Um uh, I guess it would be Jeff McGuinness would be a bit, would would be a better place. But do you know if there's been? I know there's been a the request went in from the executive by the finance minister to have increased flexibility from the treasury. There that hasn't been granted yet, or has, wasn't granted at SR. Do you know if there's uh, any more update than that? I hadn't. I, I don't know. I know it hadn't been granted, and I know mm. that treasury were playing probably playing hardball on that because they. I suppose have their own books to balance, but um, I haven't heard anything up up to date on that. Right. Okay. Okay. Pat. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to look down through it. Um, and, and what, what I'm saying is, a, a lot of the templates they're sort of incomplete. Uh, it's all of that information. I mean, how do you gather? How, how do you gather that? With those parts the, and the process, which are incomplete, in order to try and make a judgment, and where you want, where you, for me, it looks like it's insufficient detail of it. Are these the actual forms you're talking about that go back to the yes, centre? Yes, just on them there that come back to you. And I suppose my question is going to be, uh, as lead on it, uh, should we, should the department probably not be setting that standard that they get them in? Probably much quicker than the other departments. Uh, well, in fairness, we we do get ours in on, on time, don't we? <laughs> right. I um, would hope. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, we get but them the on rest. time. There will be there will be exceptions. Um, uh, the the rest I, I couldn't answer for. Uh, there will always be I I know reasons why people can't get them. There'll be decisions at the last minute that are right. taken that impact on people's budget, and it's still better to get. Money back to reallocate early, um, or uh, late. Sorry, no, not at all. So, um, well, it's fairly, you're fairly happy with the process. And it's robust. I, I think from, from from our department, we're happy that we we go out early, get the information back, and we do challenge our our business areas on what they're 
actually either giving up or bidding for yet before we put it, because I think as a department we're putting under much heavier scrutiny than other departments by our own permanent secretary and others who, in the um, role, I'm not saying other permanent <coughs> secretaries don't do that, but particularly I think uh, DOF, as you say, have to set an example. So there's 1.55 million as a result of that uh, from buildings not being open, as you had said. Uh, yeah. Given that it's been known for some time that that uh, that we're in that lockdown, uh, is the I'm, I'm just looking at the availability of the contract as a result of the restrictions. How does that work on when we move out of this, or we try to? Is that money held back, or? Unfortunately, not. You know, it's yeah. it, it, this has always been a I, I suppose a, a gripe with all departments that you can't just carry over your end year money into next year. So okay. if there's slippage, you know, it goes back to the centre and it can be reallocated in year. But um, as far as the next year, there's only so much can be carried over from the centre um, into the next year's um, budget. So we can't be guaranteed if, for instance, um, we can't get all our work done on our buildings this year that we'll get the money next year. Unfortunately, right. that, could, that would be too easy. Could that not have, could, and it's not a criticism again, could, we not, could you not have looked at that maybe earlier on in the process, knowing that the pandemic at least was there? Uh, well, I, I, I'm yeah, not, at the back you mean, sorry, should, should we not have given the money up earlier on? Uh, well, well, I suppose we didn't, we, I suppose like anybody, we didn't know what was going to happen with the pandemic, whether we were going to be able to get contractors in to do work, you right. know, how, how quickly the buildings were going to be filled and, and reopened again. So, it, you know, it's a movable feast and we didn't, I suppose it would be difficult for anybody to project forward uh, what was going to happen as far as COVID was concerned. All right, thank you. Yeah, just, a, uh, just, Stuart, just to talk a bit about one of the things we've obviously seen is concerns about recruitment within the civil service and delays in recruitment. So obviously you would have known fairly early on because recruitment process takes in the civil service three to four months. Mm -hmm. You would have known sort of the end of uh, sort of the second quarter that you weren't going to be able to fulfil the sort of recruitment requirements. So why wasn't that money sort of reallocated earlier? Uh, well, we did give some up. I think we gave a million up in last smaller term. Because I notice how you, you used the term. It says no, we kept it just in case <laughs> when you were talking about other issues. Did I use that term? Yeah, did. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Um, uh, well, I, I, I'm not saying we keep stuff just in case for, uh, you know, just for the sake of it. I mean, if we don't know what's going to happen, that's slightly different than keeping yeah. it just just in case. From that point of view, we don't just squirrel it away and not let people use it. Uh, it's mine. You can't have if, it. <laughs> you know, if we don't know what's going to happen going ahead, obviously we have a responsibility to make sure we have some sort of contingency to cover what's yeah. happening. My second question is probably a, is a bit more concerning. Look, I think it's great that we've got the additional money to to be paid out to support businesses and the rest of it, but we have now a very short window of time to get that money out for firms to be applying for it and the rest of it. What are we doing to make sure that that money gets to the people who needs needs needed to be there? Uh, well, as I say, LPS have processes in place and they're working extremely hard o over time, getting a lot of people working on that area to get the the, the money out as quickly as possible. As you can see there, you know. I mean, I was really pleased to say you know, sort of, we've, we've got another thirty million out the door. Yeah. That that's really good. Yeah. What I think is maybe as concern is that we will go into the new year. We'll, be, we'll not be back here until the second week in January, and we could be in a situation where the money has stalled going out, and then we're into a real rush to try and get it out before the end of the end of the financial year. So um, maybe could you take us an action to uh, and send a note to the committee in the new year when you get back, how that sort of profile of the money is going? Because yep, sure. obviously, if we come back and discover there's still sort of a sizable amount of it needs to get out to businesses who need it. You know, we, we've we've got we we really need to expedite how we manage that, and anything yeah. we can do to help that. But no, very happy I'm just quite that. conscious is that you know we're into next week, everything will <laughs> slow down. A lot of businesses are, you know, have, might have got the application process, and as an MLA, I think we're all aware that some businesses are are struggling to, you know, find the right paperwork or the right number from HMRC or whatever they had to get from Invest or whatever they've had to do and all the rest of it. It's not a criticism of the finance department. It's just the the process that's happening. Yeah. So I'm, you know, it, it's good. You know, I, I was I read that figure and I was a bit concerned because we've only got 23 million out, and there's much more to go. But actually, having 50 out is good. But you know, I'm really concerned. We come back in January and discover that figure hasn't much increased. 
So if you could let us know of a note of that, that would be that would be very good. The rest very of it. Janice, you've sat there and said nothing. Would you like to say anything? <laughs> I'm, I'm quite happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, <babe. laughs> from Happy Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, please, on behalf of the committee, take back to the take back to the department, and I'll drop a note to on the committee's behalf. I'll drop a note to Sue for all the, the department. Anyhow, wish them all a happy Christmas and a peaceful New Year. But uh, you know, try and get a bit of rest, and um, it's going to be a very very busy New Year. But uh, thank you very much today. Thank you for coming. Thank in. you very thank much. You. Cheers. Thank you. <coughs> okay, team. Next up is oral evidence. The Royal Institute of Charitable Surveyors on dilapidation payments. Could I invite Adrian to come in, please? Uh, the following papers are relevant to the agenda item. The clerk's brief is on page 29. Uh, the RICS is briefing paper on page 32. Uh, the Department of Finance's paper regarding outstanding dilapidation payments over the last three years, page 35. Come on in. And raised paper on page 38. Dilapidation protocols for Great Britain on page 54. And the Norwell Nairn pre action protocol for commercial actions is page 65. Adrian, thank you very much indeed for coming in. And please, would you care to make a, an opening statement? Uh, yes. Uh Firstly, on behalf of the RICS, thank you for the Not invitation to uh, come in and uh, give evidence. To the Maybe it's been quite area. useful just to explain. Uh, we became quite interested in the whole dilapidation process okay. when we noticed there seemed to be a considerable variation between what companies considered to be a dilapidation process, what they were looking for, and what was actually paid out by the department. And there seemed to be a considerable length of time between those sort of things happened. Yeah. So that's just so it gives you awareness of uh, it came to the attention of the committee early on. And I think it started raising quite a few questions in our heads. Yeah, and we thought we would like to have the experts in here to try and explain to us. But that, that's, that's just the background of it. But please, you know. Thank you. And I've, I've had a quick review of the excellent uh, research paper that was presented yeah. at, at the last meeting. Um, from I say I, I'm not actually an employee of the RICS. I'm, a, I'm in private practice, and I a partner of a, of a local firm here in Belfast. But I have practice in London and Dublin, and I specialise in dilapidation. So I've got a, a, experience across the the, um, the various jurisdictions. Uh, I, I've prepared a, a brief paper which I've shared. I don't, do you want me to go through the salient points? Yes, please. Just, just go through the salient points. That would be excellent. That's oh, so, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so the dilapidations guidance note. It's very much prepared in the legislation and case precedent of of England and Wales. Um, the uh, it, it must be acknowledged that there is different jurisdictions. As, as, uh, kind of significant issues as the chair has just just uh, identified. Uh, we are reliant as landlord and tenant to the Daisies Act, which is uh, significantly dated of 1860, and we don't have any case precedent here uh, specifically on, on repair or dilapidations. So we've got the English case laws, which would be persuasive, and, and uh, we make reference to them as well. Uh, in Northern Ireland, there's been a number of mediations that have been going through. Some settled, some are actually active disputes currently. Um, they're obviously private, so there's nothing has come from that. Uh, this isn't new. Back in the, uh, I think the final report that was produced by the Land Law Working Group back in 1989, this was explored uh, for about a decade from surveys, etc. And there was the pros and cons of the, the English and the Irish legislation uh, came from that. So as I say, it has been debated for, for some time, but we are still dealing at it with it from a a, a, con, a common law perspective here in Northern Ireland. Um, can, moving on from that, if we look at the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927 in, in England and Wales, uh, Section 18 is a, is a significant part there. And in the Republic of Ireland, we've got a similar uh, scenario where you've got what's called a Section 65 of their Landlord and Tenant Amendment Act, uh, uh, 1980. And what they look at is um, the diminution value, which is the statutory cap, uh, which uh, applies, uh, and it is in them two jurisdictions. Uh, and it was explored, as I say, in, in the Land Law Working Group. And what they do is they look at uh, two, basically two valuation positions. So say, let's say valuation A, which is in a compliant state. So if um, the tenant at the end of the term has done all the repairs, done all the decorations, done everything, handed the keys back, the building is pristine, um, complied with the lease, that would be considered the compliant state. Uh, conversely, uh, 
a tenant may do no repairs, very little decoration or very little compliance works that's needed, left all there, fit out on chops and changes throughout the term and delivered the building up in, in quite poor condition. That would be the valuation B, which would be the actual condition that valuers would look at. Uh, I'm a building surveyor myself, so valuations is a, is a very specialist area in itself, but building surveyors would feed into that um, valuation that assessment. If I maybe give a, an example of that, which, 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 which might help everybody. So say a landlord was bringing the, the property uh, to market and they had this the valuation A, the compliance state, let's just say that's a million pound, for example. And the, the premises, he brings it to the market literally on the day that the tenant leaves. And uh, the condition is not great, it's quite poor, the tenant hasn't done what they should have done in compliance with the lease. And the maximum that that landlord is able to achieve, let's say, is £800,000. So there's a £200,000 shortfall mm -hmm. between the valuation A, which is the compliance state, and the valuation B, which is the, the actual condition. In England and Wales and in the Republic of Ireland, that £200,000 shortfall would effectively create uh, the diminution value cap or the statutory cap. Now, it may be that the works that's needed to that theoretical building is maybe 300000 Mm -hmm. to put it into repair. But as I say, in the in English and the Irish situation, that repair cap would still be the 200,000, whereas mm -hmm. here in Northern Ireland, that would be 300,000. Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference. Uh, we just don't have that here. And I say that's a very simplistic view of, of the valuation process. It's mm -hmm. significantly more complicated than that. But I think that, that you know that's a good indication of, of the kind of the principle of where that comes from. And it's not necessarily the case that the valuation um, well, it, it can be exactly the same as the repair cost. It can be actually be higher. So actually, there's an enhanced value. So it's not always the case that the valuation cap is always going to be less than the claim that's presented to address the repair. So um, just to, to to clarify that point, um, I say on the guidance note, we've got we don't have a specific version of it for Northern Ireland. So the uh, one that I've, the document I've mentioned there, that is considered international best practice outside of England and Wales. So that's what, we, as practitioners, we would look towards as how we would actually conduct ourselves and, and uh, consider uh, professional kind of competence and a high standard. Uh, dilapidation claims itself, it's an allegation of a breach of contract by the landlord against the tenant. And the breaches are identified in the document that's called the Schedule of Dilapidations. And that will I'll not bore you, but it identifies the full range of things. And that can identify things such as repair, decoration, cleaning, reinstatement, statutory compliance. And there may be other specific elements in the lease, the, the covenants that is identified, that, that there may be a requirement, for example, that a tenant has to replace the carpet at the end of the term, that that's a given. So you know, there may be very specific draftings in there that that needs to be picked up on. Um, and there will be consequential costs as well. That might be loss of uh, rent, uh, rates, insurance, professional fees, etc. So that all built together can come into a heads of claim. Uh, in terms of um, the schedule and looking to, to our position, uh, under common law, the, the damages is, is effectively the assessment that's, that's made, and it looks at the cost of the repairs, and that might be regardless of whether the landlord has any intention of physically doing the repairs, doing substantial alterations or even demolition. And again, that's the common law rule position that we have here. Uh, and that's, the big, again, the big difference that, that we have. Uh, the best evidence of that is obviously where the landlord has gone and physically done the works. They've tendered the works, they've then presented the tendered or the final account to the tenant, and that can be a comparison of, well, there's the works that we've had done, that was the schedule of dilapidations, and there can be a line-by-line -line account taken of that, and uh, prima facie evident that's the best position to be in, but it may well be that the landlord is in kind of a valley of indecision, doesn't really know what they're going to do with the premises, maybe not in funds that they can actually do the works anyway, so they need the dilapidation funds to physically repair. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's an institutional landlord, so you will have quite a, a range there available. Um, and obviously, when the tenant and landlord entered into the contract, which is where I think the, the, the big the importance of it from a Northern Ireland context is, um, 
the contract is agreeing or the lease is agreeing the intentions of the parties at the beginning of the term before they've actually entered into the, to the lease. So it's uh, incumbent on, the, on both parties to be kind of informed of what they're doing. So what I would have clients who, for example, and this is me as a practitioner, not as RICS, would have um, pre-lease surveys undertaken, for example, so that they're able to say, well, there's issues with the roof or there's a, mm -hmm. a, a defect with that wall, et cetera, so that the lease, can they have, they're in an informed position, they can then decide whether certain bits are caveated out under the contract. Mm -hmm. It may be a schedule of condition is appended into the lease, and, and, and that helps assist drafting of the contract or the lease, and then each party knows what they're expected of through the duration of the term. And un unfortunately, we, there is a scenario, and, and I act for landlords and tenants, where a tenant would receive a, she a dilapidation schedule and go, well, we've paid the rent. What's this all about? We would never have expected to receive this, but they have contractually entered into requirements that need to be done at certain either painting every three years or five years or reinstating and, and that type of thing. And they may have t undertaken, which quite regularly happens, unauthorised alterations, which may not be in compliance with building control, for example. So the, the landlord could get encumbered with all of that cost for stripping it out or not even have the benefit of even using it. So it's, it's, it's by no means a simple end of term scenario of here's your schedule and everyone um, walks away. So as I say, that, that, that's quite a, a difference. But the principle is very much set. I mentioned the paper there about Jonah V Weeks, but that is looking at the, the common law uh, uh, situation. Um, Process-wise, in uh, England and Wales, they also have the civil procedure rules. And from that, there was an acknowledgement by um, the dilapidations panel of the RICS and the Property Litigation uh, Association that some of the drafting of schedules maybe by some inexperienced practitioners maybe wasn't uh, as well presented or as, as uh, comprehensive as it should have been or over exaggerated, etc. So uh, a pre-action protocol, uh, which is termed the dilapidations protocol, was, was prepared. And it gives a good roadmap for uh, practitioners in England and Wales in terms of how the document should be presented and even in terms of timelines. So uh, the service and even the response, they say reasonable time, which they had deemed to be 56 days mm -hmm. and even meeting uh, a 56. I think it's our, it, as I say, that deals with their protocol. We have a Northern Ireland protocol, which differs, I think it's 21 days. But the, um, yeah, so that initial discussion, I've, I've got a copy of it here, and I can, I, yeah. I can hand it over at the end. Um, and there's a, a flow chart that shows the, the, the course of action to be taken. Um, it is beneficial, I'll say, for the less experienced practitioners to aid them in that process. It also has that once the tenant has responded, that a meeting should take place for negotiations within 28 days thereafter. So it, you know, it does have kind of get posts and assist that stop take undertaken and then if still no movement then procedures follow. In England and Wales how often does it fairly regularly keep to the schedule? Uh, I had a good chat with a number of my English colleagues over the last week. Um, I think in principle it is followed. Um, it is very much if you find uh, the other practitioners the other side aren't playing ball that is used as a reminder to them that they should be following the protocol i'd say it probably comes more into effect if it does go to litigation and then at least reference can be made back to well that party didn't engage or didn't follow through or didn't provide as per the guidance note documentation so that will put them in a poorer light um, and I think it's, it's very much like the, the pre-action protocol that we have here with, in the High Courts, that the, the whole intent of it is to try and make things more efficient, mm -hmm. get them through, reduce costs and uh, time in the courts. So it, it, it's just to keep that whole, that whole process moving. But as I mentioned there, the Northern Ireland one, it, it's, it doesn't go as far as the likes of the dilapidations protocol, but the protocol does rely on the landlord and tenant law in England and Wales, which we don't have here. Yeah. Um, so that is also a difference in it, because the intention is that there is some discoverability as part of that early process, as part of the dilapidations protocol. So the, the, a diminution value, for example, may be something that's presented earlier than uh, theoretically here, where that may become a, a, a debate. 
uh, when we're going through the courts. So you know that is that is that is quite a significant uh, a difference between the two. Um, I've mentioned the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I say it's, it's very much moving things along, making them more efficient and getting them through. Um, it must be acknowledged that a lot of, case, of dilapidations claims do get settled privately. Um, I have had cases where we have been instructed, inspected, served and agreed and received payment within a two-week period. I've had other ones that have gone into years. So, Any government departments you manage that on? I, I have in the past not had any government clients <laughs> that I've dealt with. In Northern Ireland, I've acted for landlords more so in the north. In England and Wales, Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, we have quite a few public sector clients. Mm -hmm. I think that's more a reflection of how they deem dilapidations as a specialism and how it sits outside frameworks, etc. But that's a completely different conversation, which I'll not get into. <laughs> um, so, the, as I said, it's... Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've had a few that have settled quite quickly, I have to admit, with public sector, but they've been not the kind of quantum that's been mentioned in the, in the briefing document that yeah. I've seen previously, which are quite significant. Um, and it, it all comes, you know, there is, I've mentioned there about repairs and decorations. There's a lot in the tenure documentation. It's, it's not a black and white issue at the end. Um, it, it is complex in terms of the interpretation of the contract, which is, goes right back to my very first kind of point of dilapidation shouldn't be an adversarial aspect right at the end of the term, it should be something that's considered at the beginning because the, the kind of the honeymoon period is great, it's the divorce at the end which can be either be painful yeah. or amicable and some tenants do all the works that they need to do right through the term and there can be very minor things that just need addressed at the end and others do no repairs as I say or no decoration and quite blasé about what they're going to return back to the landlord. So that, that's really where the issues are. Um, obviously, the courts in the RICS strongly um, uh, recommends alternative dispute resolution. Uh, my colleagues, in, uh, I've had a claim recently here in Northern Ireland that successfully was mediated. And my colleagues across the waters have advised me that we would typically have between maybe five or ten claims a year within the practice that would go through to mediation where there's, there's been a narrowing of points, mm -hmm. but there's just one or two hard points, just there isn't a meeting of minds, and that does assist get things resolved and typically to the satisfaction of, of both parties. And even bringing together principles sometimes can focus that process as, as well, um, which I, I appreciate government departments have numerous parties involved in that, and that's maybe not as simple to, to do. Uh, but yes, mediation we have found to be very beneficial uh, as, a, as a practice. Um, the mechanics, I think just kind of closing, the mechanics of that process, or ICS members are supposed to follow the, the, the guidance note. Uh, it is best practice, that is what we're supposed to do. Uh, there are non severs or RICS members who uh, deal with dilapidations as well and maybe not in the manner that they should and uh, the kind of with cost and time implications to that as well unfortunately but um, as I say we we don't have a Northern Ireland specific guidance note so we do. Wouldn't there be a it? fairly standard um, appreciation of dilapidation costs for particular things so it would be you know, you would realise for within buildings for if it was reconstitution of walls or whatever it happened to be, um, reconstitution of you know repairs. You know, there would be there would be a, an agreed order of costs, wouldn't there? And there would be a, there would basically be an industry standard, wouldn't there? There's a number of ways of dealing with that. The um, the evidence that would be looked at the the RICS actually has a dilapidations price book. Mm -hmm which would be a starting point. Um, it obviously relies on evidence that's gathered from practitioners UK-wide, and there's a... Well, so if you, you, know, if you had a, an office building, you would say costs are... You know, the, the, the standard cost would be X. There would be base costs that we would refer to, but it's like as if you went out to tender to a contractor. Not every contractor is going to come back with exactly the same price. There will be some that can get certain things more competitive than others. Uh, government bodies would have measure term contracts, for example, so there's set rates, prices, mm -hmm. PSA on that. 
Um, and it may well be that as is some elements are, are more it's a smaller element of work, so it's slightly more expensive per meter squared than a significant large building of maybe a hundred thousand square feet that, that there would be more competitive rates at, mm -hmm. attained there. So there will be a, a variety or range of rates and, and that's where the, the skills of the surveyors come in um, of narrowing that down. And there may be a obviously a starting point from each side and then there's is that narrowing the gap and, and meeting of minds and it may well be Obtaining tenders or, or fixed costs from from contractors to to try well, and address. In your experience, them. it would we would say that sort of both sides would be fairly aware of the RICS's dilapidation handbook. So they they would be aware of that. I in my experience, I have found their rates to be slightly higher than in in the real kind of market conditions here practicing. Um, but it would be definitely a reference that that we would use, and I would expect most practitioners to do that. And there are other. Um, published pricing documents that's out there. Um, historic tender rates would also be used. So if, uh, we've in-house quantity surveyors, so I would just discuss with them what rates they maybe have been obtaining from contractors or indeed if what they're putting together on estimates. So that there's a wealth of information. So I wouldn't say there's just one source. And um, and again, you need to be considering, you know, the, there's, it, it's not just about the cost. There's, the repair itself, the standard of repair is important. Mm -hmm. So that would, you know, the, 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 um, the old chestnut case of Proudfoot v Hart, you're looking very much at the age, character and the locality of the premises. So the quality of painting and plastering, for example, that we would do in a building such as this would be very different to an outskirts industrial estate park. So, you know, so all them factors need taken into mm -hmm. account and they would reflect on the actual costs yeah. as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Thanks for your presentation. You did say earlier that, that you've settled some very quickly, some uh, disputes. Is there much of a difference, have you found, from those that you've settled quickly from the original ask to what the payment was? It, it has very much depended on the, on the claims, I say, and there are occasions where evidence comes out just through the negotiation process. Uh, so it might be a fairly simple thing where it's just, yes, we're just redecorating and we're replacing carpet and the area is X. So that's quite simple and then that can be reached quite quickly. Uh, it's where there's m the more complex elements of maybe what was actually demised. So, for example, the chair was talking about of replacing walls. You know, it, was that wall actually part of the demise at the beginning anyway? Yeah. Has that something that's been built? So I'm not painting it and yeah. I so the all of that needs looked at, and, and in some of the more complex cases, that's where it comes into that, that gets changed. So, like in your view, would you uh, the dilapidation dispute against the public sector takes longer to resolve compared to that which is against the private sector? Uh, well, the, the meeting of minds of the surveyors might be relatively similar. I, th I think it's the, the process after that, where it's maybe the, the budget holders are having to justify the payment of it. When you're dealing in the private sector, usually there's commercial pressures or you're dealing with a, an individual. Um, and there can be other factors that it's a case of, right, well, I actually have a tenant coming in and I want to deal with things. So, for example, a lot of our institutional clients would actually deal with the dilapidations very early and try to actually get the tenant to do the works before they vacate. Mm -hmm. so that a new tenant can literally walk in the day after and they see that as a, an advantage I'm to them. I'm, I'm trying to get to a different point. I'm looking at, like, in some cases, the amount of the dilapidation claimed against the agreed settlement can be subject to quite significant variations. Yeah. So, for example, there's a case of 270,000 claimed yeah. that was settled after 15 months for Ely. Mm -hmm. And there was another one where 260,000 was claimed and was uh, subsequently settled for 35. I would imagine them head, the, the head costs that you're identifying there, they would include things such as your loss of rent and, and, and mm -hmm. those head claims, which is over and above just simply the repairs that's needed to be done. So it may well be that there's been arguments around that, for example, because it's dictated very much by market conditions. So um, that might be something that was conceded on by the parties. So I'm not aware of them. Settled on. I mean, I'm, but my question is mm. from the difference. I'm just looking at it from 
professional yeah. point of yeah. view, Chair? Yeah, no, it's just, it's just it, I don't, it's, you said the thing about, about the RICS dilapidation, but so everybody would know what they were claiming from, because if they were coming from a common sort of baseline. Mm -hmm. So when you put together your first dilapidation payment, obviously that's based on the baseline, based on the book, because obviously you know it's going to go to litigation because somebody's not going to pay you. But then to settle for something that's so significantly lower, but the, the, the concern I think we have, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying, I'm not speaking for all the committee, but I'm just trying to articulate some of the views that we've had, mm -hmm. is the fact that there seems to be a pattern where, you know, um, so the landlord saying, you know, I, you know, I'm putting into appellation claim for, you know, a quarter of a million quid, and then because it takes forever in a day to get it settled, they, you know, they end up settling for thirty-five or eighty grand, yeah. and there seems to be such a divergence of that and you know what we don't know is that what it's like in the in the commercial world it it, it is it, that does happen and it, i say it comes very much down to that contract and what actually is the demise and what's required by the parties and i say act for landlords and tenants so i do look at things from both sides not yeah. purely from a landlord's perspective and we have settled claims which are only five percent of the original landlords claim right. that's come in okay. and it has simply been because when we've gone and looked at the actual the, the lease and the other tenure documents that things have come to light that actually that wasn't a valid claim so the rates which we've been talking about is not it's not even relevant because that element of work that was requested the tenant has no obligation to do okay. so that's just struck out of the claim completely and it can be a number of them that can have big differences on it. So it would be incorrect to just assume that the dilapidation revolves around the construction rates alone. That's not the case. It's very much looking at um, you know, what is the breach and what's the subject matter that actually is in contention. Right. And I think and this is where it gets into the more complex side of the dilapidations. And I I would suggest that non experts in the area mightn't appreciate some of the nuances. As, as in practitioners, as I'm, I'm talking about, and are looking at things at face value and haven't actually drilled down um, into what the tenant is or is Time scale, 13, 15, 18 months, is that sort of fairly that common? sounds long to me. Yeah, so, uh, that's good. Thanks, Chair. So, look, I, I can see where there are variations mm. in that, but it's recognising that, uh, I mean, the cost between those parties of those two examples that I give, the variations. I mean, if there could be a reasonable variation, I would have thought of 10%. Mm. Possibly 13% of what originally was claimed was the eventual payout. I mean, mm. how, how do you, I mean, that can't be, you can't measure that or any sort of rules that you have that could bring something down from original claim to the, the payout we accepted as 13.5%. Yeah. yeah. It's, That's the bit I can't understand. Yeah, no, and as I say, it'll, without knowing the detail of the specific oh, yeah. leases, it, it does come down very much to what the contractual obligations are in the parties. And it might just be that the landlord in them examples has just taken a commercial decision that he just wants to get rid of it. And, and that is something that... that uh, you know, Take the money in. Uh, yeah, it's like enough this, this is going on for far too long and I'm only going to incur more legal costs. So you know that that commercial decision will very much come into it as well, but it does go back to what's been presented and the liabilities of both parties. And there is a, a big element of it in in office accommodation is the M and E installations, and you know they could be nearly half the claim. Mm -hmm. So they may or may not need replaced, and 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 that could be hundreds of thousands in some of the the larger claims, which I'm sure have been presented in, in the research paper. So that, that, that and, and again, it might be a case of there's a replacement of air conditioning, for example, that could be nearly half a million pound in itself. That could be completely removed by undertaking certain testings or isolated repairs, etc., okay. or been challenged. So it's not just a case of saying, again, that the rates are vi widely out of kilter with each other. It's, it's that certain elements of the claim where I've been challenged and proved to be incorrect, and that is just the normal process of evidence. And maybe that's where the protocol in England and Wales brings some benefit in that some of that is teased out maybe a bit earlier in the in the um, in the process or in the claim itself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just going 
Thank you, Lois. You're welcome here this thank evening, you. and thank you for your presentation as well, too. Uh, just a couple of things that just in my own head about it. Uh, in terms of, we'll say, uh, like public uh, service buildings and the likes of it, or whenever uh, they're involved in dilapidation claims, do you think is there a tendency maybe for uh, the claimant, because it is like um, um, a government building as such, that their claims will be much higher than what normally you would expect in other situations? Yeah, it, from from personally from my perspective, I would see no difference. It, uh, if I'm acting for a landlord, I will act in their best interests against whatever tenants in there. And conversely, if I'm acting for a tenant, I will do my damnest uh, to act professionally and get as best a result for them. So, um, and, and and I would deem that to be the case across the board. But it's it, it very much depends on the buildings because I think. Uh, most likely, the, maybe the public sector leases are longer. So, mm -hmm. like if you have a building that maybe has a 20-year lease, for example, compared to more contemporary leases, or maybe five or even yearly rolling ones at the moment. So, the amount of things that can go wrong and need repaired in a very short lease are vastly different to a 20-year lease, for example, which I think is probably the majority of the the ones that we're, we're talking about in, in in the research paper. So. You will have services going back to that. A lot of them will have a lifespan of maybe 15 years. So they've come to the end of their, their serviceable life and maybe having bigger issues anyway. Mm -hmm. So just through the nature of a longer term lease and it's maybe been a bigger um, a footplate, it's going to be a large sum of money uh, that has to be dealt with. And I think that, again, that's quite a, a a key thing. So again, it's going back to the very first part of looking at the lease of well, we're here for five years. We're going to have to decorate it once. A schedule of condition will record that mm. the air conditioning and equipment's nearly on its last legs, etc. So we want to make sure we're not getting hit for replacement of that mm -hmm. at the end of five years. But when you're talking 20, it could be brand new equipment and a new build. But because of subsea guides and disrepairs and maybe even obsolescence, um, even in our current climate, trying to get equipment from China to replace air conditioning systems is extremely difficult. So things like that bring in other costs mm -hmm. that, just because of the passage of time, are, are, are a factor of, of the claim. Yeah, well, just in the event then of uh, disputes and so on, and there's a number of different stages and uh, arbitration in one of them, who are the arbitrators in situations like this? Uh, there's a few uh, barristers in Northern Ireland uh, who act as mediators. Um, the RICS has a panel of expert determination, as does other um, law society and other parties. So, you know, there is that skill set out there as mediators to you know get involved, but there, there needs to be that narrowing in, of the issues between the two parties and then focusing on what the key remaining items are rather than going and nearly starting afresh, uh, which I think is a, a considerable cost. But um, as I say, it, it comes down to, I think, the expertise of the surveyors themselves dealing with it from the very beginning. And if they're able to get it to a, a reasonable uh, commercial settlement, fantastic. And I says in the majority of cases that I deal with, that is what happens. And it may well be that there's 10 or 20 grand difference and the two parties decide just to split the cost because they see the legal fees far outweighing that yeah. difference. But um, in, you know, to go back to your earlier point, no, I, I wouldn't see there been a target on public sector tenants by any means. It's, they would be you know, the least, it's kind of irrelevant who the, the party is that's in there. It comes down to what the contract is and what's the lease. and you're acting for the landlord, that's what's used to make the assessment. Um, if there was, uh, if there was say, a, a sole trader that's literally about to go into administration, there would be a question mark on the landlord of, well, is there actually any merit in that party incurring costs to chase something that isn't there? Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. Um, so the strength of the covenant would come into it, but that would be if it was an institutional client or a mm. government uh, client or whatever. That's you know that factor probably comes into it, but that wouldn't dictate whether we're going after one party or far, far from it. In addition to you, have alluded there on a number of different occasions to the the 
difference uh, in the legal position in regards to the Republic of Ireland and England and that of the North of Ireland. There's been a diversion there somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. uh, and that um, in what way do you see the legal position in the North of Ireland being of a hindrance uh, or a help uh, in terms of uh, resolution? Or does that law need to be in some way updated? Or uh, I it probably is, as I alluded to, there's two ways that it can be addressed, either through change of um, the, the legislation itself of the landlord and tenant law, which isn't something that would happen overnight. As I said, the last review was in the 80s, and I don't, I'm not aware of any current intentions to review that again. The other way around it is if there's actually a case precedent, so that somebody actually goes the whole way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would uh, suggest that would be two big hitters on the landlord and tenant side with deep pockets who are willing to do that because it's not a cheap exercise by any means. Um, so it would be one, it'd either be a change in legislation or a case precedent that at least parties can refer to um, to address that. Because there is, uh, there is as, as we were, were discussing this as a contract law, a common law issue, there is an English contract case which can, is referred to, but it's not here. And, and it's that type of thing that um, I think would probably change it. And I've had a few that have run quite far, but not gone the whole way. So without that case president, we're not going to have any change. Yeah, because it's too expensive to take it to the course president. So yeah. why would you, when all you want to do is get the money out of it? Yeah. So that, you know, that is the issue. But do you think that is there a need for legislation here at present? On, um, I would suggest that there is, yeah, to address this, and I think the RICS, I think, have made that suggestion, and the law reform report, final report, it also suggested that needed to happen. Okay. That's myself, Jim. Yeah. Um, my goodness, when you talk about DC's law, it takes <laughs> me back further than I want to think. Back to first year land law lectures, but uh, there you go. Uh, two issues I want to explore with you. Where you don't have an institutional landlord, but you have an institutional tenant, such as the government in Waterfront Plaza or wherever, uh, although it's, sorry, it's, it's not a good example, but what I'm concerned about is, does the institutional tenant with the deep pockets mm -hmm. uh, have the advantage, because there isn't a level playing field, where one, the landlord who needs the money, can't afford to hold out, can't afford to take it the whole way, and ends up being exploited by the institutional <coughs> tenant by simply sitting back, making a low offer, knowing that in time the non-institutional landlord will accept it. Does mm. that happen? Uh, I would imagine that there are cases of that where it comes to, and I said it goes back to the, the, the position of the landlord, which you've correct, correctly stated there. It might be a, so, a small sole trader and mm. they need the rental income and they just can't afford it and yeah. someone with deeper pockets is just trying to play ball. I, I, there's a moral issue there, I would suggest. Yeah, but when you look at some of the figures we've been given, mm. where claims have been settled for as low as 10, 15 per cent, uh, and the settler is the government, uh, that would suggest that there may be exploitation. Against the landlord? Yes. It could well be the case that it, if, it if it's so prolonged the process to get it approved, and if they're in financial difficulties, I could see a private individual or a private landlord making a commercial decision that well, I need to pay my loan to the bank to keep that building or whatever, and, and that might be the deciding factor from regardless of whether they're right or wrong. But also in the sort of the sorry, Jim, just in the in Northern Ireland, of course, because the public sector is such a large part of the economy and is such a large user of buildings and private rented buildings. So in some effect, not only do they have, as Jim would suggest, they have sort of institutional advantage, but I think if you were a private landlord, you'd be very wary of taking what is potentially your biggest customer too far. 
Uh, and again, they're commercial you know, decisions by landlords more than mm. anything else that, yes, if it is a potentially a large tenant or client sitting out there, do you want to rock the boat with them? Um, but you could say that about any te you know, large tenant occupier. Just particularly though in Northern Ireland because the market is so distorted by the amount of sort of mm. public buildings. It would be a view taken, I'll say this is completely outside of RICS opinion, but that would be a view that would be taken by the landlord themselves. But to, to go back to the, the point that we were, we were discussing there, if, if, say, an institutional tenant such as the government or the public sector um, didn't repair the building through the duration of the term, so the landlord gets a, a, a very poor standard building at the end, you know, there, there's maybe arguments of willful waste and things like that that can be brought into, you know, so is it a case of an institutional client going, well, at the end of this, I'm just going to put up a big fight and not pay out what's due, and I'm not even going to look after the building during that term. I, that, that can't be correct. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so whereas if the building is complete, is, is going back to the, the, the conversation we're having there about quick settlements, if the tenant has looked after the building, they have their housekeeping's in order, they've repaired it, they've painted it, they've replaced their condition equipment, etc. It's needed. There's very little debate at the end. It might simply be the case of thank you very much, you're a great tenant, and I'll take the keys off you. It's where you've got this adversarial position of the tenant has decided to do the basics because of maybe funding reasons or whatever, just to be compliant with whatever they needed to do. But there are lots of issues at the end that need addressed, and if it's a small landlord who just can't pay to do the works, so that becomes a big issue for them, and it just forces their yeah. hand. It might just need to make yeah. a commercial. I was a bit surprised to hear you say that there have been no precedents. That means no one has taken pushed this to court ever. It's, we haven't got any decisions on it. It's gone to court, but we no judgment. No judgments. And does it go to the Queen's Bench or does it go to Latin Tribunal? Um, Queen's Bench, from I mean, the ones that I've done. I've, I've only been on a few that have gone back so as a basis. We normally get... Um, so they simply go on the basis of breach of contract? Yes, breach yeah. of contract. second issue I wanted to ask you about was uh, our law is self-evident, I think, lagging behind, mm -hmm. uh, and there has been a recommendation from law reform that it's, that it's simply been ignored. If you could rewrite the law, mm. what would be the key changes you would make? I, I think there's a lot of um, positives to be taken out of the, the English and the Irish position in terms of that diminution position. Uh, for example, if there was dem demolition of a building, for example, um, and I think that would be quite clearly an, an RICS position on it as well. So. Yes, it'd be it'd be looking towards that section 18 and section of the English position in section 65 of the the Republic's Landlord and Tenant Act, whether that could be looked at. Now, there's, there's positives and negatives in both of them, mm -hmm. and I think um, I think Professor Wiley had been involved with quite a lot of the drafting That's of them. Going back a long way. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> so he, I think just parties like that would be worthwhile. Uh, discussing that was, what did law reform recommend? Um, they were looking at, I say, I'm off the top of my head, it was very similar to section 18, where you were looking at that diminution cap and yeah. if there was significant structural alterations or um, demolition, yeah. that that ref should reflect on a statutory cap. On sure, the, I think we should be asking the department why law reform proposals weren't followed up. Well, actually, I was going to put a proposal to the committee after the evidence yep. that we would write to the department to consider law yep. reform and to take the evidence from the sessions we've had so far to uh, inform that decision and ask them to report back to us on what they're proposing to do to reform the law. If I think that would be our... Matthew, you're nodding. No. No. Apologies, <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Thank you for your... Yep. Uh, just one final one, Adrian, just yes. before... Um, look, one of the things we're trying to do is encourage Northern Ireland to be a great place to come and do business in. Yep. And obviously one of the things that Northern Ireland is very short of is Grade A office space. And having been involved in Dublin in the hunt for Grade A office space, and it's extraordinarily difficult to get, 
And one of the big concerns is how you rapidly turn it over. Um, Google Olympus is a classic example of how office space is rapidly turned over and sort of the concerns they had about dilapidation. Mm. But of course, one of the things that we do with due risk registers and due risk and due diligence before they come and sort of try and secure office space with the rest of it is what is the legal framework for everything to do with that as well. Mm. I sense that because Northern Ireland is an outlier, not having something that would be recognised in London or something that's recognised in Dublin could actually work against us when it comes to people coming to go and looking for sort of um, renting space and looking for high quality space. So do you think that reform would probably be also helpful for improving the Northern Ireland economy and also making it much easier for people to understand the sort of the, the property market within Northern Ireland? Yeah, I uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, at least puts it on an on a even kind of plane. Um, I always have great difficulty with American clients trying to explain dilapidations to them. Yeah. Uh, the, the concept of it is alien. I think the American approach is you I know a particular it. Boston company had that conversation with me not so long ago. Yeah. Well, that approach or the American type leases where they actually pay an enhanced rent, so the dilapidations is effectively rentalised across the term. Yeah. So within reason, you're you're walking away. Now there will need to be the checks and balances at the end, um, and the co-working type environment, which we have seen very much in, in in Belfast in recent years. It you know is an example of that, whereby you know you come in, you open the door, and you just trade away and you walk away again. Yeah. But you're you're paying more for that. Yeah. And that's the difference that needs. And 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 again, that comes back to the commercial aspect of. The landlord might be willing to buy out the deal apps, but at an enhanced rent. Yeah. So you know there. But it all comes back down to say the very beginning of being informed. The party's been informed, knowing what they're actually getting into, mm -hmm. and addressing it that way. And it may well be, and I have seen some commercial leases where that has been addressed, but the rents have reflected the risk that the landlord has then taken on. So that that's that's another way of dealing with that. Adrian, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for informing us. And may I wish you all a, a happy Christmas and a happy New Year, and uh, keep safe. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, committee, the proposal that we write to the department and ask them to look at the reform of the law in this section, I think we would be agreed on that. Yeah. Agreed. Content. Agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, may we move on to the next uh, item on the agenda? Was going to be the oral evidence on the Department of Finance budget statement. I just want to brief you on the discussion I had with the Minister earlier on today. Uh, Jim uh, McManus and I met with him by teleconferencing. Uh, just the main points that the Minister informed us that the budget paper was brought to the Executive last week but did not get onto the agenda. And uh, I understand that it is looking to be tabled tomorrow. Uh, the Minister attempted to arrange a meeting with the First Minister to, uh, to clarify a number of points. And it was attempted to put on the item on the agenda, but I think because of a Brexit briefing that would bend. But they're trying to get it onto the agenda now. It was the minister's intention to get the draft budget discussed and agreed uh, at the executive meeting, uh, and he's going to push quite hard for that because otherwise it would be the second week in January before it could have been agreed, and that's quite frankly not acceptable. So I have asked the minister to get back to me if he's not getting it on the agenda, uh, but uh, he, he gives an indication to do that as well. If the draft budget is agreed by the executive, it is the minister's intention to make a written statement tomorrow, as soon as the meeting is complete, and an oral statement at the first plenary session of the assembly. Uh, the cons consultation process, remember, is supposed to take eight weeks, and that will start immediately after the minister has laid the written statement. I agree. I think that would be a good approach to do that as well. The final budget Sorry, must sir. be laid by mid-February in order to have sufficient time to pass the budget bill before the end of March. Uh, the Minister is content to attend the Committee on the 13th of January to provide oral evidence on the budget, draft budget, dependent obviously on it going through tomorrow. And uh, I think that if there are any changes, you will be informed. I will inform you by email if there are any changes or anything, and I will keep you updated during the period of time if we are content. Content. Matthew? I was just going to briefly ask does that eight weeks include Christmas? Yeah, it does. Uh, that's, uh, compared to the past, Matthew, where um, we didn't even have the consultation period, I think uh, even you getting the budget. Uh, <laughs> budget. I think this, this is, it, it might sound strange, but this is a great improvement. I'm aware. <laughs> if yeah, we get yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, can we move on to item number eight in the agenda, uh, SR 2020-308, the Rate Relief Coronavirus Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2020. Draw the members' attention to the items on the agenda, page, uh, Clark's note on page 72 and the Rate Relief on page 73. The purpose of the rule is to amend the Rate Relief Regulations uh, to provide a one-off payment in lieu of notice, or sorry, of a, a one-off payment in lieu of notice and holiday pay are disregarded when rate rebate awards are being determined. The, subject, the rule is subject to negative resolution procedure at the Assembly. The Committee considered the SL1 at its meeting on the 18th of November and was content with the policy proposals. There have been no changes in policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee. Uh, the examiner's statutory rules has informed the Committee Office that the statutory, will be, statutory rule will be in the next ESR report and will not be, it will not be drawn to the special attention of the Assembly. If we are in agreement that the Committee for Finance has considered SR 2020-308, the Rate Relief Coronavirus Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the ESR's report, has no objection to this rule. Are we in agreement? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, if we move on to the next item on the agenda, SL1, Financial Assistance Airports Regulation Northern Ireland 2020. The following papers are relevant to this agenda item. The clerk's briefing note at pages 31. The Financial Assistance uh, uh, Airports Regulation Northern Ireland table at page 33. The letter to me on page 37. Ministerial written statement on page 38. I inform the members of the purpose is to allow the provision of up to $7.8 million in total of temporary financial support to Belfast International Airport, up to $3.7 million, and Belfast City Airport, up to $4.1 million. In light of the significant financial difficulties these organisations continue to face as a result of COVID, the rule is subject to negative resolution and assembly procedures. It is proposed that the rule will come into operation today. Chair, just to correct on that, sorry, we've just been emailed. Apparently, it will not come in today, and there is no operational date given as yet. Just for information, sorry, Chair, you were saying. Oh. Written for our decision on it. Yeah. Hmm? We're written for our decision. That <laughs> Uh, given the absence of detailed analysis and economic appraisal coupled with the fact the SL1 well comes into operation today, but it doesn't now, <laughs> the Department has asked to place officials on standby. Look, um, the Minister has, we have heard Minister's um, uh, responses in the Assembly. He have, he's responded to questions we've given to him. Uh, the Department of Economy and the Department of Infrastructure have neither managed to provide the necessary financial assistance to the airport as we have. We know from the budget position that money had been set aside to support the airports as well, and I think that, um, bearing in mind the circumstances, uh, I think we'll be minded to uh, minded to support this uh, minded to support this SL1. Um, Would we be in agreement? Hold on, hold on, hold on. One, two, three, four. Yeah, work, work, work. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to have to drag Pat back in. There. <laughs> okay, right, members. Therefore, that the committee has considered Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, financial assistance, airports regulation, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Agreed. May, may I, Chair? May I ask a question? Yeah. Um, about um, uh, it would be helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we don't agree to the um, limited financial support. But it would be helpful to understand if, in the context of the um, not being able to form a value for money determination, whether the minister, whether there was any consideration given to um, whether it requires a ministerial direction purely for the sake of consistency, because I'm aware that other measures across multiple departments, including economy and infrastructure, have required, yeah. have required ministerial directions. So it would be helpful to understand. That's not to say we should hold it up. It would be helpful to have a clarity on whether there that is a consideration or, or consistency. There. Well, since we've already agreed to it, uh, that's the one bit. But we can ask uh, Aidan. Are you there? So can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to bring uh, Aidan McMahon on to uh, the spotlight, if he possibly can. Hopefully he's there. Aidan? Hi, Aidan. Did you hear the question? Can you hear me? Sorry, could you, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, it's from Matthew O'Toole. Hi, Aidan. Thank you. My question is regarding the, um, the briefing given to us by the department indicates that uh, it was not possible to under 
to um, undertake a detailed, econom uh, detailed analysis and economic appraisal that would usually underpin a scheme of this nature to inform a value for money determination. Just wondering if that was the case. Is there was a ministerial direction sought on this? Uh, a ministerial direction was given. It was uh, for the package. Correct. Fine. So there, there will be a letter. Then the, the auditor general will receive a letter on this ministerial direction and details of it. That's correct. Okay, that's fine. Yep. Okay. Happy. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I th I Thanks, Ed. Thank you. I think, Chair, we should have been told that. Yep. I agree. It is quite an important matter, to be honest. That we should we should be told. I mean, it's a ministerial direction. Yeah, I mean, it's not. There's nothing underhand or wrong about a ministerial no. direction. There've been loads of them in in the context of COVID here and in London. I'm sure elsewhere. But it's just a. It would be a. I think it's a good practice. Okay. So can we? We'll write a note to the department and ask okay. them for the update and evidence of the ministerial direction. Okay. And okay. ask make a request that we are informed. Of any future ministerial directions. Good. Agree. Okay. Thank you. Cheers, Ian. Uh, next item on the agenda written evidence, Department of Finance, Public Procurement, Common Frameworks. At last week's committee meeting, members agreed to schedule oral evidence on the Department of the Public Procurement, Common. F f I'll say that again to schedule oral evidence from the Department on the Public Procurement Common Framework and further agree to ask the Department to immediately provide full details of all organisations that issued a summary framework to and copies of all responses received. The response from the Department is page 81. Advise members two organisations, the Construction Employers Federation and the Social Enterprise Northern Ireland have responded to the Department's invitation to participate in the feedback process for the Common Framework. I would like to seek your agreement to schedule oral evidence from the Construction Employers Federation and Social Enterprise NI. And we also present an opportunity for committee to receive oral evidence from them on the Public Procurement Common Framework, the Procurement Board, which I believe is sitting today for the first time, mm -hmm. and the Dorm Dormant Accounts Fund. You may wish to suggest asking SENI to provide a paper on the committee covering all three areas. Would we like to get a paper from Social Enterprise Northern Ireland on these issues? Yep. Great. Yep. Uh, remind members that last week's meeting, the committee sought an urgent explanation by the Department as to why Cabinet Office guidance was not followed and why, regardless of Cabinet Office guidance, the committee was not furnished with important information that had been issued to stakeholders for more than six weeks previously. The response from the Department is tabled at page six. Has anybody got any comments? Yes. We're obviously too easily overlooked. <laughs> Shall we note with a sceptical eye? An equivocal eye? <laughs> yeah, hold it. <laughs> okay. Noted, so noted, suitably. Uh, move on to the chairperson's business, item number 10. During recess, it's practice to delegating authority to the chairperson, deputy chairperson, to consider any non-routine contentious FOI requests. If any such requests are received, the views expressed by the chairperson, the deputy chairperson, and the response issue will be considered at the first meeting for the recess period. As members are content to delegate authority to consider any non-routine contentious FOI requests to the chairperson and deputy chairperson during this recess period. Great. Great. Moving on to correspondence, the, cor the department response to the committee's question on the departmental progress report the to the Equality, co Equality Commission, page 96. Any comments? If to seek agreement, therefore, to consider the response again, if appropriate, during the committee's consideration of the Northern Ireland Civil Service reform. Great. Uh, the departmental update regarding localised restriction support scheme on page 101. Do we have any comments? But, Chair, I must say I'm still experiencing, on behalf of constituents, delays in getting responses since they made the ruling that it has to be diverted through the department rather than directly, mm -hmm. LPS. 
and I'm also experiencing difficulties in getting details and timings in relation to appeals of those who have been refused. I don't know what other members' experience is, but that continues to be mine. Um, it's been, we've had one, and I must admit the response was uh, pretty good. You know, it had been rejected, but when we went back, the response hadn't been had been pretty good. So, um, yeah, maybe we should. Uh, you know, do you want to make a proposal? No, I'm I'm quite happy to have it stated on the record that that's been my experience and the yeah. understanding that the department will pick that up. I think it. I think, and I don't know if any other um, members have got any comments to make on that. But I I think there are some have gone through reasonably well. Some have been problematic, but have been responded to quite quickly. And I must admit, it's my experience that it's speeded up a bit in the last two weeks. Not yours, Emma? No, mine has been the opposite. Oh. Last week at the committee, I was praising staff, and then I went on a, another route, and no, it's been, it's slowed down. Slowed down? Yeah, right, okay. And it was on appeals too, so. Yeah. Right. Matthew? Oh, my, mine is pretty slow as well. Okay. In the room. Uh, and uh, I do rate it to the time when they said they could no longer, should no longer go directly to LPS. The yeah. diversion through the department seems to be the source of the problem, I think. Should we write to the department asking them to restore the approach back to LPS? Because that seemed to work pretty well. Meaning the generic localised restrictions at. <laughs> oh, you're looking at me quizzically, No. Right. You normally look at me quizzically, but you're looking especially quizzically at the moment. Do you deserve that look, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> no, it just, it just seemed to be that when we were working with LPS directly, it seemed to be worked quite well. Reasonably I think well. In general terms, there's a, you know, Having a single inbox to which elected representatives can email and know that their queries will be yeah. within reason prioritised is a democratic and clear way to do it. You then get into situations when your people are understandably want to do the best for the constituents, and we end up emailing people we know and just using and you know, or people that people may not know, but names we know, or and and I suppose that then those people feel themselves under pressure because they're getting personalised emails when they've got other stuff to deal with. So. Generally speaking, if the resources there, I think the, the best practice for both the department and us is just a clear, generic inbox to use, with the understanding that they would, um, as I say, within reason, prioritise elected representatives to to where they can. Are we content, therefore, that it just goes on the record our comments? Great. Yeah. Okay, move on to the next item on the agenda: correspondence from the bus and bus and coach and I, bus and coach and I regarding financial support scheme scheme for coach and bus operators at page 103. Similar correspondence has also been sent to the Committees for Communities and Economy. Uh, have we any comments? Are we content uh, that the Committee for Finance would support appropriate, appropriate proposals from the Department for the Economy or the Department of Communities to provide additional s assistance to the sector and to inform the Minister that that is the case? Are we content? Yeah, I would agree, because this sector has been wiped out. Yeah. Completely wiped out by the coronavirus, much more than perhaps any other sector apart from nightclubs. Okay. And uh, if you're happy, I'll inform the bus and coach and I of the committee's agreed approach. Great. Uh, departmental response to committee's request for written briefing regarding questions raised by the Royal Society of Ulster Architects on building regulations for nearly zero en energy buildings, page 106. Do we have any comments? Happy to forward the department's response to the RSUA for comment for information. Mm. Okay. Uh, correspondence from the Committee for Justice regarding the health protection regulations and the Department for Justice not engaging with committees, page 116. Do we have any comments? Happy to note. Noted. Uh, response from the Minister for the Economy regarding financial support for travel agents, page 120. Do we have any comments? Um, Sorry, could I make a comment on that? Yep. When you strip out all the um, 
cut and paste that comes in these matters, it seems that there was no specific bid made at any time to help the travel agents. As I think we've discussed before, they have particular issues where they are now having to refund money that was keeping them going because of cancellations. And um, I'm just disappointed the department didn't do more for them. I, uh, Sorry, go ahead. I, I broadly speaking, I, I agree with that. I think there's a um, like there's a strong argument that um, there's an argument that the, you know this group has been helped by other um, schemes, but the minister could be slightly more straightforward in just saying that because it sort of dances around it and then says they you know, they can get they can get help through these various different other schemes. Um, certain travel agents have got the uh, hospitality, tourism, and leisure scheme, but that's eleven out of presumably hundreds mm. across Northern Ireland, and uh, ultimately it's a bit. Um, we bit mealy mouth to talk about meetings you've had with people, not to be too pointed about it. <laughs> yeah. um, the other point is um, we issued the request for information on the 14th of October. If you notice the date of the 11th, it's the 11th of December, mm. and the department should have 10 days. It normally should be 10 days to respond to us. Now, the department initially was quite slow in responding to us, but then actually started meeting its timelines. But this one seems to have fallen outside the scope. Um, but I just want to uh, advise you that um, following a meeting with the Association of Northern Ireland Travel Agents, the Minister of Finance has been asked to respond to a number of proposed actions. Uh, I think I would like your agreement to ask the Department to provide details of what those proposed actions on which the Minister has been asked to respond and to provide us with a copy of that response, just so we know what's going on. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, next item on the agenda, departmental response regarding the procurement Board Terms of Reference, page 122, 122. Do we have any comments? Well, it's a succinct letter. I have nothing else. Mm -hmm. But I just want to inform you, I believe the Procurement Board is sitting today in the first, in the first format of its being ref, uh, of reformatted. And uh, I would like to schedule an oral evidence on the procurement board with the minister and representative board members uh, now that it's up and running early in the new year, if we are content. Good. So, so Joe, just to be clear, is it correct then that the only communication the committee has had about the procurement board is this letter, which come to, comes to us on the day its first meeting? Mm -hmm. Well, the procurement board technically was is still was in existence. It's been yeah. reformed. Yeah, the re, the reformation of it. It's refor reformation of it, and the minister did make us did it inform did make us in the house yeah. and made a statement in the house. So, yeah, but today's I only found out today when I was talking to the minister that he was that he was having his first meeting with the procurement board. Because there were points raised in the assembly about whether there should be an independent chair of the procurement Correct. board. Which indeed I think I raised. It might have been. Yeah. But we shall be able to ask the minister about that and representative board members uh, early in the new year. Okay. Content. Uh, departmental update regarding North South Ministerial Council Special EU Programme, uh, page 123. Minister has agreed to the committee request that he meet with the three cross border bodies. Any comments? Uh, seek agreement to forward the response to the cross-border bodies for information. Happy to note. I do agree. Yep. Uh, seek agreement to note. Uh, the response from the Minister to query from the Committee for the Economy regarding VAT payable and PPE imported from the EU to Northern Ireland tabled at page 8. What do we think of that? That's in the table papers. Table papers, yep. Is the 
first pregnant pause we've had in 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I read it, we're going to be liable for VAT on PP. Yeah. It's ginormous. Um, I propose that we write both to the Minister and also to the Minister for Health, uh, asking them for clarification. Do they believe that uh, is, are they expecting to pay VAT on PPE from the date notified? And also, is there any attempts at mitigation, particularly with the Treasury, to do that? Because this is, is it recoverable? I would have thought it should be, isn't it? Should be. But I think it's right that we establish that because it needs to be established. sums involved are ginormous, 20% mm. of a vast bill. And if we like could, if it's only moving money that you get back, it's... Yeah, it's only going around the system, that's mm. fine. It can be got back within the financial year. But if it can't, then the implications for Robin Swan's department are just horrendous. Yeah. Are we content, therefore, to write to both the Minister of Health and the Minister of Finance? Uh, next item on the agenda, Committee for the Economy to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister regarding the TO Task Force and taxi and coach operators being excluded from the COVID restrictions business support scheme, table at page 11. Are we any comments? I'm confused about this because um, private uh, taxi operators were entitled to pay in the self-employed borough payments. And there's also a one-off payment of £1,500 from the Minister of Infrastructure. Yet I note that just over half of all the taxi drivers who were apparently entitled to that have applied. And a taxi driver came on to me and he explained that his total income normally per year is £9,000 a year. Well, he gets his 80% from the self-employed um, furlough scheme plus his 1500 He's actually getting more <laughs> than he was earning apparently for the last three years. Because it's 80% plus the 1500 pounds more than what he was claiming to have earned in the previous uh, three years. So I, and yet, and taxi drivers have been quite vocal to me about saying how much they deserve help, but then why did only half of them apply for it? Does anybody know that just seems a complete mystery? As to why only, I think it was 5,000 taxi drivers applied for the one-off 1,500 pound payment. All they had to show was their insurance to prove that they had a taxi business and their usual details. So why then do they write to us saying they deserve more help when half of them aren't applying for it? Just, just a thought. Any other comments? Well, I think it's other than saying this is a, a useful question that the economy department is asking. Happy to note. No. Uh, take agreement to note the remaining sorry. items of correspondence. Uh, really? To note the information request to the department, and to note the routine paper circulated on Friday the 11th, uh, December 2020. Really? Uh, move on to uh, forward work program. Four members of the forward work program for January to April 2021 is at page 133. I remind members that last week's meeting, uh, meeting sought clarification on the reference in the forward work programme for drivers and barriers to change and improvement. I advise members that the committee's strategic plan has an agreed output to receive oral evidence from PRSD, NIPSA, OECD and other key stakeholders, including those involved in decentralisation of the public sector and the ROI, to identify and understand drivers for change and barriers to change. I also inform members that UCAS has agreed to provide oral evidence alongside the Fire Safety Engineering Research and Technology Fire Cert on 30th of January 2020. Uh, also inform members correspondence from the ministers relating to the dormant accounts fund is tabled at page 15. This includes the minister's statement and the strategic action plan for the fund. Uh, I would like your agreement to schedule oral evidence from the department on the dormant accounts fund in January. Are we content? Mr Chairman, I brought this up. Uh, I must say the minister's statement and the information we've now been given does provide a fair degree of clarity yep. as to what's happening with this substantial amount of money. Uh, so we're a lot better off than we were this time two weeks ago. I think the fact that we're also scheduling oral evidence from the Department of the Dormant Accounts Fund, 
I also think we may, might be useful as to talk to the National Heritage Memorial Fund. Fund. National Heritage Fund. National Heritage, the the, the fund. I think that would be quite useful because if they're going to be, if it's all going to be auspices of theirs, I think it'd be useful to understand about their governance and their uh, how, the, how how they're proposing to manage it. If we are content to do that. Okay. Thank you. And the committee is content with the draft forward work programme for January to April 2021. Okay. Uh, just before uh, I bring up a or sort of a, my first item of AOB, um, you will be aware that uh, we're losing our clerk, Jim, who's moving on. And uh, Jim is uh, going into semi retirement coming in January. Jim, can you hear us? He's too young. <laughs> Good. Uh, I just wanted to say, on behalf of the committee, Jim, you have been an outstanding clerk. Uh, you have uh, managed me, and you have managed us very well indeed. Uh -huh. You have kept us on not only on the straight and narrow, but in a committee that is, in many occasions, is uh, mired in considerable detail. You have managed to not only keep on top of it, you have been able to make sure that we are all appropriately informed. You have been able to lead your team very effectively. And you have been a stalwart, not just for the committee since I've been the chairman and for the committee members here, but for the length of time you've been in it as well. And I'm glad you're not escaping fully because uh, we really look forward to seeing you in the new year. I apologise that you're not here personally, where we could have uh, given us all as a few, your, our effusive thanks and made you feel even more embarrassed. But I just wanted to say thank you very much indeed. And if, uh, if you would like to say a few words, we'd be more than delighted. Jim, sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry, just an assembly broadcasting to please unmute Jim, oh. please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, it, it has been a very, uh, very busy and challenging, and in many ways, a difficult year this year for, for everybody, but uh, in many ways, quite a, an enjoyable year, too. I mean, I, I was never bored. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, I want to say thank you very much for, for your kind words, comments, uh, and uh, I am looking forward to spending more time social distancing from my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thank you very much indeed, and hopefully in the new year, if things get back to normal a bit, we'll do something a bit more slightly informal to thank you, and I'm sure that the rest of the committee will, uh, will join me in that as well. But enjoy Christmas, enjoy the new year, keep safe, and uh, keep socially distanced from all those grandkids. <laughs> okay. Any other business? Yes, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I think, I think Jim should stay on for this section. Mr. Chairman, the committee has met for almost a year. Uh, we first met, I think, at the end of January. Can I say, I said in the Assembly on Tuesday that I believe that people were put on this committee for being naughty. And I noticed that you were just about to intervene and to, to pull, me, pull me up on that comment. I, I did originally think I would have been placed in this committee for being very naughty, but I have to say I found this last 12 months to be a very pleasurable, profitable and interesting experience. And I think a lot of that goes down to the, your expertise as chair. You've kept the meeting flowing along very well. Though we did notice, mind you, when the vice chair was put in, in control last week, the meeting was halved in time, but well, maybe he was very fortunate and got a very late agenda. But I would say I think it's reflected in the fact there's always a very high turnout of this committee. The attendance is probably the highest of any committee in the Assembly. And every month, every week, there's something fascinating comes along. It is not a dull, turgid, boring committee by any means. So I found it a pleasure. So I've gone from the situation that feeling that I have been thrust out into the desert in the Finance Committee to a situation now that wild horses wouldn't pull me off it. <laughs> so I think that gives you an indication of how things have gone. So it's been a very pleasant experience. I know you'd booked the Donadby in for a fabulous lunch for the committee, the chairman's lunch, <laughs> but because of the whole social distance issue, you had, you had to cancel that, and we understand. But there's always next year or the oh, following definitely. year. So uh, it's been a pleasure, and I just pay tribute to you for all your hard work over this last 12 months. Well, thank you very much indeed. But from my perspective, is I have thoroughly enjoyed chairing the committee so far to this year. I've thoroughly enjoyed everybody's contribution. And to say that I have learnt a lot is to put it mildly. And I thank, that's why I thank Jim and I thank you all. And I also thank the fact that 
Um, some of the questioning we have been able to give has been quite incisive, and there are some areas that, um, particular, and I mean this very importantly, things like um, building regulations, where I thought, what real value added can we bring to this? I think that's already beginning to realise the importance. I forgot of where to mention the hard press staff, Mr. Chairman, particularly. Uh, Jim here is clearly lying about his 52-year-old age to try and get early retirement. There's just no way, Jim, you're old enough to be retiring early from anything, but we just have to accept that. Certainly, Jim and me and all the team. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, do, Chair, if I, if I can just interrupt, can, can I take an opportunity to say a very big thank you to my staff? Because I think I've been very lucky in the staff that I've had. Uh, this last year, with everybody with COVID-19, the members haven't gotten to know them. They, they haven't been there, but they are working diligently in the background. And I just want to say that I'm very grateful for the support that they've given me and the support that they give the committee. And, uh, and, and I will, and you just stole the words out of my mouth because I was about to thank everybody. <laughs> and I was going to thank you. Thank you for stepping in at short notice. And uh, thank you very much indeed, the team and the staff, for everything they've done. Uh, the next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 13th of January, uh, 1400 here in the Senate chamber. Be aware that I will be in touch with you if anything changes reference budget and if there are any other sort of potential changes, just in case uh, there is the committee's re reformed on an ad or the assembly's reformed on an ad hoc basis, just in case anything else comes up to, between now and the 13th of January. Uh, just finally to me, it says, please be safe. Keep all the social distancing. Make sure that you stay safe and the rest of it. And I want to see you all back here, bright and bushy eyed, ready to go in January. But thank you very much indeed. Thank Good. you, everybody. Thank you. Keep, keep. Hold on. Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber, programme signed.